Hello viewers, Ford DIYers here with another tutorial video for everyone. In this particular video here, I'll be showing you how to replace your cigarette lighter or 12 volt auxiliary port with a USB charging port and voltmeter combo. For this, I'm using my 2006 Dodge Ram as an example, but I'll try to keep this generic so it applies to any vehicle. I'll go over all the important points like determining which port is switched with the ignition and determining polarity. For a regular cab truck, it has three of these cigarette lighter 12 volt auxiliary ports, so I thought this would be a great upgrade instead of carrying around an adapter for a USB charger, and I can keep an eye on the voltage when listening to the radio while the engine is off. Not all vehicles are equipped with a live voltmeter on the gauge cluster, or there can be sometimes an issue with accuracy. I purchased this online. This version has an aluminum outer body, and a link to this will be included in the video description. You can also get versions without a voltmeter, and the same procedure also applies. This version also comes with an aluminum polished outer shell, as well as a green and blue display. Mine has a red display. This also came with pigtails and crimp terminals, however I'll be using my own instead. In order to install mine, the radio bezel does need to be removed. With this particular truck, there is two screws just above the cup holder, however mine were missing. Next was using a nylon trim tool to disconnect the clips holding on the trim piece. With it currently being cold outside, be careful with the plastic as it can be brittle. Once removed, tilt down the top, there will be various wires in behind that needs to be disconnected. Start with the one side and work your way across. Each connector will have a tab that needs to be depressed, then remove. The 12 volt ports may need to have a small tool to depress the tang. Now to determine which is the switch source. Some 12 volt ports remain on all the time or they can be switched with the ignition. This can be checked using a multimeter or a test light and I'll demonstrate both examples. First using a multimeter, set it to the two digit DC voltage setting. Make sure you do have the leads in their correct position. This will help determine which wire is positive and negative. With the key in the off position, test the plugs for the 12 volt ports. These can be probed from the front or rear, whichever is easiest. As you can see, one has no voltage and the other does have voltage present. Therefore, it's on all the time. If you've noticed the value was negative on the meter readout, this means the polarity is mixed up. Therefore, the positive is negative and the negative is positive. So when the leads get switched around, the value will be shown as positive. Therefore, the black lead is on the ground and the red lead is on the positive. This will need to be known when connecting the new port. Next, I have stuck the probe on the back of the connector so they stay in place. Then, turning on the ignition, the circuit has powered up right away. Once the key is off, the circuit turns off as well. Using a test light, this too can determine a switched power source along with the polarity. Instead of hooking up both wires to the plug, the test light can have the negative wire connected to a known ground source. This can be another connector to the battery post, sometimes a body bolt onto the dashboard, or a bare metal bracket. It's best to verify the connection with a reliable power source, such as a battery. With a known ground source, the light will illuminate when it comes in contact with a live power wire. As you can see, it powers up on the non-switched 12 volt power port wire, but won't power up on the other one as the key is off. When the key is operated on and off, you can see the light turn on and off. The wire at the connector being tested is the power wire, the opposite not being tested is the ground. With the key off, the connector casing can be removed and you may be lucky enough where the terminals do connect to your new port. However, in this situation that wasn't the case. I also tried sourcing out a connector that connects to the factory connector but I was unable to find one so I'll have to cut the wires off instead. Slide the outer retaining frame on the connector forward. There is two tabs in the back that needs to be disconnected. Once forward, this will expose the tangs on the inside of the connection, pull those away from the terminals, then remove each of the terminals. I'll provide a close-up in a moment. The test light has a sharp enough tip where it works great for accessing these tangs. With the connector removed, I just cut off the terminals. Then strip the insulation so the appropriate length of conductor is exposed. Twist the wire strands. Using the correct size, crimp terminals based on the wire gauge, install the terminals on each of the wires, then crimp. Whenever a crimp connection is done, always give it a pull test to ensure the wire is firmly in place. 
I did a quick test using the new port to ensure it's working correctly. Now you're done here, and next is moving on to the bezel. Here is a view of the rear side of the bezel. There is two screw mounts on the bottom, one is broken. Then there will be various clips on the back side. As for the factory 12 volt port, it has a outer shell that holds it into place. From what I've found, the inner frame does slide out first, then the outer black shell can be removed. For some reason mine was jammed in place and I wasn't able to separate it. The inside of my factory port is rusty so I won't bother keeping it anyway. Instead I just broke off the mounting tabs, the rectangular slots exposing the chrome and behind is where the tab locations were. As for the plug, the clear outer plastic is what keeps the terminals in place, along with small tangs on the inside. Here you can see one of those tangs, they need to be pulled away from the terminals in order to remove them. The new port doesn't fully fit and the hole isn't completely round, so it does require some sanding. This can be done with a small drum sander on a drill. The finer the grit, the cleaner the finish you'll achieve. It's only plastics the material removes fairly quickly. First was sanding the flat side, then test the fit of the new port along the way, making sure it's the correct size. Take your time, don't cause any damage to the bezel. This can also be done by hand using sandpaper wrapped around a dowel or even using a small rotary tool. After a couple minutes the hole is the correct size. Some plastic fibers or hairs may be around the hole and this can typically be cleaned up by rubbing your finger around the edge. Install the new port. If equipped with a rubber cover, make sure it is aligned properly. This rubber cover will keep the port looking clean and provide protection from any dust or dirt. Install the large nut on the rear. To snug up the nut, it may be hard by hand so interlocking pliers can be used. For this I'm using my fine adjustment interlocking pliers made by OEM Tools from Mobile Distributor Supply, model number 22645. These do come in a kit. They have a fine adjustment on the jaws, which is quickly and easily operated by a button. With the hardened jaws, they ensure long life while providing comfort for a user with the soft rubber grips. A link to these will be included in the video description. With the nut only being plastic, it can be easier to damage so I would recommend wrapping electrical tape around the jaws. Don't over tighten it as it's only plastic. You just want it tight enough where it won't move or come loose over time. Then verify that it's straight. If not, make adjustments as needed. Finally the bezel can be installed back into the truck. Plug in the rest of the connectors. I find starting with the one side and working your way across is best. A test run can also be done to ensure everything is working correctly. The new port does have terminals marked with a positive and negative so make sure you do have the correct wires in their position. Snap the trim back into place and reinstall any fasteners if required. Once done here you can see its operation. The rubber cover does have a tinted transparent window so the voltage can be viewed while the USB ports are protected. Depending on your vehicle's design, make sure you do take measurements on the port you're considering on purchasing to ensure it fits. There is no need to add a fuse for the new port as this circuit is already fused by a factory. New videos are released every week on my channel. Be sure to hit that thumbs up button. It's a huge help to me and leave a comment below if you found this tutorial helpful. If you're not a subscriber, be sure to also hit that subscribe button. Thank you for watching.